Hey, hey, hey. Welcome to the seventh episode of Tea with Tea. Um, We have had a little bit of a lapse because I have just kind of been overwhelmed and doing a lot of stuff. You know, we're in the middle of a move. I recently transitioned to being a stay-at-home mom. You know, I've got the two boys, Eric, and since Eric is still working full-time and then some, um, a lot of the moving and packing and, and coordinating has fallen to me. And I realized that a lot of people don't know in terms of, a lot of people don't know when to ask for help. You know, we're in this culture that praises people for working themselves to exhaustion, working themselves into a hospital bed, just continuing to push and push and push until you have nothing left. You know, we were, you know, that generation that was raised during sports practices being told to earn their water, earn your rest, when really that's not how as a human being you are supposed to operate, especially mentally and emotionally. And um, kind of we're going to talk today about knowing when to get help, what kinds of help are available, try to, to dismantle some of that mystique around mental health and what kind of helps out there. Um, Okay, so normal overwhelming feelings. Uh, You know, like like I said, I've got a lot on my plate, so sometimes feeling like I'm scatterbrained, I'm spread pretty thin, that's okay if it's short term. If you're feeling spread thin, overwhelmed, you don't know where to begin constantly, then you may need some external help. You know, whether it's uh, talking to a friend and seeing hey, is, do you think there's something that I could take off my plate? You know, talking to a manager, seeing, hey, at, with work, is there any way that you can help me work more efficiently? You know, sometimes it just takes an outside eye, you know, a partner, a family member, a friend to say, well, why don't we stop doing X, Y, or Z? Or how about we combine A and B and we'll just split it between the two of us? You know, it, it just, that's that's the first step of help. You know, just seeing if, since you're too close to the project, you know, is there something that you can something that you can do easily, but you just didn't realize it because you are the one who's, you know, overwhelmed. Um, hey, bud. You're not overwhelmed yet. Um, another thing, if you are constantly feeling like you're failing, like you're not doing anything well enough, things are constantly falling through your fingers, then that combined with that overwhelming feeling or where you always feel like every time something goes wrong, you immediately get anxious. Your feelings elevate to like an 11. You're immediately panicked and anxious and and sick to your stomach every time something goes wrong. Then it may be time for you to go past the asking for friends help or tagging in family members and seeking professional help. That could be a sign of an imbalance and you may need professional help to try and get your hormones or your whatever chemicals in your brain in balance. Human beings are social creatures and we oftentimes do crave hanging out with people. Sometimes we do feel a little FOMO, you know, fear of missing out when you see friends do something without you or when the opposite, you know, where we agreed to, to go and hang out with friends, but then the day comes and we're like, I would literally rather do anything but leave this house. You know, there's two sides to that feeling. You know, once in a while, feeling like that is totally fine. But if you find that you're feeling absolutely lonely and miserable, then consider joining a group of some kind. Not like a like an AA group, but like, you know, a group of people, find people in your area or online who like the same things that you do. That way you can get involved with discussions. You can get involved with debates. You can interact with people, whether digitally or in person. And that's something that can help stimulate you. I find sometimes that when I'm feeling a little isolated or lonely, I just need a little stimulation and then I'm fine. Um, Some people, you know, uh, they get their stimulation and then They are overwhelmed and they just need to unwind alone. You know, introverts need to recharge by being alone. That's fine. Extroverts, they recharge by being around people. And that's fine. 
Some people, they need a mix of both. And again, that is fine. But if you find yourself alone 97% of the time and you still feel like you just don't want to do anything, you don't want to be around people, that could be a sign that you're depressed. And clinical depression is different than just being sad sometimes. Clinical depression can involve, um, you know, you don't feel joy in the things that you used to be happy in. You don't want to take care of yourself. You don't want to engage with other people. You don't want to eat. You don't want to sleep. But it can also manifest as you want to eat everything. You want to sleep all the time. You never want to leave your room. You never want to leave the house. But it can also manifest as, you know, someone who around people they can put a good face on, but inside they're dissociated. They don't feel anything. It's like they're just going through the motions and someone else is driving their body. And then there are some people who depression and anxiety manifests as, you know, a lack of executive disorder where they know what they need to do, but they literally cannot begin. And then that begins a cycle of, well, I can't start this. And then, well, then I can't start anything. And it starts this mental kind of snowballing. Depression and anxiety have a lot of faces because we're all so different. We're all so, on so many levels, we're different. Mentally, we're different because of the different experiences we've had. Genetically, we're different because we're different people with different DNA. Our brains are set up differently because of a combination of the two. There's no way for me or any medical professional to lay a blanket. If you have these five things, then you have depression. There are lots of lots and lots of common markers but really the person who will know the best besides you is a professional who can engage with you ask you questions get to know you and say okay I'm going to diagnose you with um and the people who can do that so there are this is another thing I've, I've noticed about you know people are like well do I need to see a shrink a shrink is not the absolute end all shrink is typically a slang term for a psychiatrist. Um, and a lot of people are like, Oh, well, I don't want to see a psychiatrist because they're, they're just going to give me pills. Psychiatrists um, can counsel you. Um, typically they may work in tandem with a psychologist or another type of counselor or therapist who can help this decide with the psychiatrist. Here's what, the, what we think is wrong. Here's what we think can be helped. Let's make a plan, a treatment plan with this patient. If you don't like the word patient, every time I say patient, substitute client because you are either, you can be a client of a shrink of a psychiatrist. You can be a client of a psychologist. You can be a client of a counselor. You can be a client of a therapist. You do not have to be a patient if that word makes you feel squidgy. For some people, it's all about, you know, putting a different face on it. If you just need to think of yourself as a client because you think there's something wrong with getting help, then that's fine. As long as you're getting help, you can tell your friends that you have a date. If you don't want to tell them, I have a therapist appointment. One thing that you'll notice when you start to go to therapy is that everybody needs therapy. Therapy and versus counseling. Um, therapy tends to focus on, um, on the long term, it addresses the root problems, the emotional patterns that you formed. And it really is, you could think of it as like, it's the lifelong learning of you and how you are the way you are. Versus counseling tends to focus on short term treatment, like very specific problems or lifestyle changes. Like you see a marriage counselor to counsel on your marriage. Um, and you may see a therapist to work on yourself. Counselors and therapists, both of them are kind of um, blanket terms for people who have certificates um, and are licensed either by state and by national licensing bureaus, but they don't necessarily always have degrees. Psychologists, uh, they will have a PhD. Um, but they don't prescribe medicine. So um, a psychiatrist is a medical doctor. They can prescribe medication. Um, 
And often, even if you do just decide, okay, well, I don't want to take pills. I want to just see a psychologist or a counselor and just try and work through my internal issues with, um, you know, just like doing the work, journaling. If some people don't want to take pills. That's fine. You see a psychologist, but there could be a time where the psychologist may say, I think that we, sh- we should loop in a psychiatrist to help with X, Y, or Z, um, because I think that you may benefit, you know, you're making so much progress, but maybe there's a final hurdle we can't cross. You know, we can't clear this, this last little hurdle without a little assistance. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's a lot of shame and like taboo around taking antidepressants, taking mood stabilizers. And I think that's because of the people who abuse them, as well as You know, like there was a media kind of period of time where the only people who were taking medications were extremely unstable or they weren't taking the right ones. So even though it's supposed to be helping with their symptoms, it's not doing it. So they're getting worse. Or now they have all these other symptoms where they're paranoid and they're becoming this or or that. Sometimes media will purposely misconstrue something to make the truth suit what they want. Um, A good example of that would be Dollhouse. If you have never seen Dollhouse by Joss Whedon, amazing show. 15 out of 10. Definitely recommend. Put a pin in that. We'll talk about that another time. But there was a character in that show who had a psychotic breakdown and she was in a mental facility and, you know, she was being given all of these medications, but it wasn't working. Well, the reason that the medications weren't working for her, spoiler alert, if you want to see the show or you haven't seen the show, but spoiler alert, she was not supposed to be taking these antipsychotics, so they were making her psychotic. Once they figured it out, they took her away from that situation. She stopped taking the medication, perfectly normal. That's one of those scenarios where this person's taking all this medication and it's not helping. Well, because that's not what she needed to be taking. She didn't need to take any of those things. Then there are other examples in the media where, oh, this person's schizophrenic and they went off their medication and now they're having this episode. That's fairly accurate. But there are times where people do need to come off their medication so that they can transition into a new medication. And they do so without fanfare, without a huge police shoot off in the middle of a courtyard. There is no shame in helping your body produce what it can't produce. You would not shame a diabetic for taking insulin. You would not tell a diabetic, well, you just need to think happy thoughts and your gallbladder will do its job or your pancreas will do its job. That's not how diabetes works. That's also not how mental disorders work. If my brain does not make feel-good hormones, me thinking good thoughts is not going to help that. It's not going to make my brain suddenly go, oh, you're right. We just weren't trying hard enough. Let's make that feel good hormone right now. That's not going to happen. If your brain needs the help, you give it the help. And there are some people who are thinking, well, to be fair, even if I was diabetic, I wouldn't take it. I wouldn't take the insulin to save my life. Oh, you're not thinking that? So then why would you think, oh, well, Just because sometimes I get really depressive or I get really sad, I'm not going to take medication. If a professional says that you should take the medication, maybe you should consider taking the medication. Again, this is not um, me saying you need medication. No. If you see someone and they think, if you see a professional and the professional thinks that you should take something, speak with the professional about your fears, about your hesitations, reservations. Because remember, a psychiatrist is a medical doctor. They went to medical school. They did their residency. They have medical expertise. It's not just, you know, us walking up to a bus stop and some man there says, hey, do you need some mood stabilizers? Because I've got some in my bag. It's nothing like that. You're seeing a professional. They're diagnosing you. They're testing you. They can even work with you on dosages. They can work with you on types. You know, maybe just like the kids who they need Adderall. The ADD, ADHD crowd, they need Adderall. Let's say that you take the Adderall and it doesn't work or you don't you don't feel right on it or you just feel like a robot. You would tell your doctor and they would say, 
Okay, let's change to a different type, like Stratera, like Vivance, like uh, the name of the next one escapes me, but anywho. Let's, t let's try that. Let's try different dosages. They can help adjust to you. Because remember, even though you are prescribed a drug, like a mood stabilizer, antidepressant, thing like that, things like that, they are not one size fits all. That's why there's different types. That's why they're different dosages. The doctor can help try and fine tune it to you as close as they can. Sometimes you may need to take one or two different pills to achieve what you need, but that's fine. You're working with a professional. That's what you need. Then there's no shame in that. And some people may say, well, as a culture, my people don't believe in therapy. We don't believe in taking medication because we just take all of our anger, frustration, rage, sadness, and just swallow it deep, deep down, and we just don't worry about it. Well, that's probably why you feel those things. It's perfectly normal to have emotions. It's not normal to shove them in a box and never address them because those things will out. And you don't want to be the person who in a grocery store over something as little as the eggs are broken has a complete breakdown. You know, that's those things will find a way. You don't want to be the kind of person who one day snaps and yells at someone when you're not mad at that person you're yelling at. You're mad about something that happened two weeks ago. And it's still bothering you. If it's still bothering you, you're not over it. A lot of people carry around the trauma of their childhood. And they just pass it off as, well, it's fine. It's not fine if you're still upset about it. It's not fine if you're still infuriated by it. It's not fine if the thought of your childhood makes you sad. I'm not saying that your childhood needed to be happy-go-lucky 24-7, but if you can't think of good times fondly, and then it passes bad times, sad, you know, a little sad, and then it passes. But if you thinking about your childhood makes you sad for days at a time, you're not over it. If thinking about your childhood makes you so mad you're seeing red and you want to hit something, you're not over it. What's the worst that could happen if you see a professional? I can't think of anything besides, like, let's say you had something repressed and then you see a professional and then it works its way out. It'll be traumatic for you, but isn't it better to know what's the demons in your closet than to just have a closed closet and have the door rattle every so often. I did not have an idyllic childhood. I had ups and downs like everyone else, but I also had some really terrible things happen to me. And I repressed a lot of it. I compartmentalized a lot of it. And then really going to counseling and going to therapy helped me immeasurably. Um, it is definitely on my list um, in the coming next few years to see a psychiatrist and really see, okay, is there anything, because I do at times feel like little things that shouldn't be a big deal, somehow my brain makes them big deals. And then things that are big deals, my brain sometimes will just purposely forget them. And I know that's not normal. I, it's also not ideal. So that's something that I feel like, okay, if I need to see a doctor for something, then I'm going to do it. I have asthma. I would never ignore my asthma and just be like, well, if I ignore it, it'll go away. Or if I just listen to some music, it'll go away. I'm going to go sit in the sun, try and do some yoga. Oh, well, I can't. I'm, I can't breathe. So if I know that my body needs help, or I suspect my body needs help with something, I'm going to get my body that help. Um, I have kicked around the idea of going to see a psychologist to see if, um, if I do need to be officially diagnosed with anything before I go to see a psychiatrist. Um, and I've kicked around that idea, but it's also harder at times to find a psychologist, psychiatrists and nursing psychiatrists psychiatry nurses, excuse me, tend to be more 
abundant, we'll say. Um, but one thing that there is no shortage of are counselors, therapists, social workers. And oftentimes they can work in tandem with psychologists or psychiatrists. Maybe they have a friend or a professional colleague that they can refer you to. Even if you just start with a therapist or a group therapy or a counselor, if you start there and you let them know what you're there for, they can help you along your journey. If your journey ultimately is, I just want to find out why I get so mad about this, or I just want to know why I can't seem to just get started on things. I know what I need to do. I literally can list every step I need to take, but I just can't get it going. Or sometimes I wake up and I literally feel like I could sleep for another week and a half and it lasts two, three days. And in those two or three days, I'm lucky if I get up and drink a glass of water. Those are all very valid things to feel. And they're also very valid reasons to go and see a professional. Some people think, oh, well, I just have bad days. And we all have bad days. But if your bad day means you're not taking care of yourself, how many of those bad days do you need before you'll realize I'm not taking care of myself? So another common excuse I get for why people don't want to go to therapy is, well, look at this person over here. They have it so much worse than I do, and they don't need therapy, so why do I? The biggest, the biggest thing I can impart on you as a human being is to remember that someone else's suffering does not lessen the suffering of you. If you stub your toe and your coworker burns their mouth on coffee, does your toe feel any better? No. Does your toe make their coffee burn less? No. Your, your problems are not made smaller or bigger, lighter to carry because someone else has more to carry. Um, I remember going to CCE, which is Continuing Catholic Education. Um, I was a cradle Catholic. I'm now confirmed. So I used to go every Sunday and most Wednesday nights to church, we'll call it church classes. And one of the lessons that has always stuck with me was when they said, if everyone in the world put their problems in the center of a room, you would look at everyone else's problems and take yours back. Just because there's people suffering in other countries or your friend who's had awful things happen to them and they seem fine and they don't need therapy. Oh, so I don't need therapy because my, my upbringing was so much nicer than someone else's. That's not accurate. And that's not fair to you or that person. That person could be a well-adjusted person because they've had counseling. Or maybe they've repressed a lot of their emotional baggage and they aren't even aware that they're carrying it. Like I said, your emotional baggage is like having demons hiding in a closet and every so often the door rattles. You can ignore when the door rattles, but when you hear that doorknob turn, doesn't that make you sit up a little bit? I like to liken getting therapy to driver's ed. Sure, everyone can figure out how to drive. But going to driver's ed just makes it easier for you to know the rules of the road, what's expected of you as a driver, what you can expect of other people, what to do in, in all kinds of scenarios. The same is true of getting counseling or going to therapy or even getting medicated. Going to get help is like learning how to drive the car that is you, that is your emotional well-being and your mental health. Yes, you can figure it out, you can muddle through, you can struggle and suffer, but wouldn't you rather just go to a place where they can teach you? They can tell you, hey, this is how you can do this. When you're faced with a scenario, this is what you can do in that kind of scenario. The next time you are hand-clenchingly mad, do this. The next time you are mind-numbingly depressed, try this. All of their suggestions may not work, but at least you've got a starting point. At least you have something to begin with. Like I said, you can suffer and struggle and figure it out on your own. Absolutely. 
But does that make you better or stronger than someone that went to go get help? Absolutely not. Someone who went to get help said, I know that I'm not doing enough for myself. And I know that there could be more that I'm doing for myself. So I'm going to go do those things. I'm going to take better care of myself. And if you're thinking of having kids at some point, remember, you are their blueprint for how to be a human being. If you are not emotionally adjusted, then your children will not learn to be emotionally adjusted. If, if you fly off in a rage every time something goes wrong, your child is learning that. Only time will tell if that affects them where they become someone who th- flies off in a rage or if they become someone who at the slightest hint of someone else being upset shuts down. Think about that. You form another person. You shape who they will be become. Like I've said in a previous episode, they can learn at your knee and become that rage monster, or they can see it and become the opposite. They can become an empowered person who seeks out how to not be the you, or it can go the opposite direction and they can be emotionally stunted. If you are emotionally adjusted and you know how to deal with yourself and with stressful situations, your children learn that from you. And if you're motivated by the idea of a future child more than you're motivated at the idea of doing that just for yourself, that's another thing that you've got to evaluate. The fact that you're holding an imaginary person as more important in your life than you, the person who is living the life. I I have days sometimes where like I wake up and I know that a bad day's coming. It's almost like an early warning sign of, hey, in a couple days, you're going to be just about useless. So you can try and do with this information what you will. And sometimes I try to circumvent it. I try to just like, okay, maybe if I can just get my sad out of the way, then maybe I'll be better. And sometimes that works. Listening to a sad playlist, maybe watching a sad movie or a sad show, getting those tears out, really crying it out. Sometimes that helps and I skip the bad day altogether. Other times I may try that and it doesn't work. And I'm just becoming more and more numb as this bad day approaches. And then the bad day comes and I feel just hollowed out. Like someone just took a scooper and just scooped me right out. And now it's just the body. And that may last a couple of days. It may last only a day. I mean, at one time it lasted for a couple of weeks. And then like I felt it slowly start to lift. Sometimes I get that early warning sign and I try a, a different path. I'm going to try to just out happy the damn thing. I'm going to kill it with kindness. And I, you know, I exercise. I get lots of sunlight. I try to plan social events with friends. And I just try to ignore it. And it works sometimes. Sometimes the bad day is, it just feels more like a bad mood that I, like I put on like an ill-fitting jacket and I just can't wait to get home and take it off. And, you know, I just hang out with friends and I feel better and it lifts my spirits. And then what could have been a bad day or two turns into like, you know, a bad hour, hour and a half and now I'm fine. But there are times where I try the positive route And all it is is me pretending to be happy in public while I am miserable. Or I'm, you know, I'm outside soaking up the sunshine, trying to go for a walk. And really all I can think of is how much I'd rather be anyone else but myself. And how if I was someone else, I wouldn't have these problems. If I was a normal person, I wouldn't think these things. You know, other people, exercise works for them. Why doesn't it work for me? And it almost makes the bad day worse. Really, as a human being, we're not given an instruction manual. We are really thrust into these meat suits to figure it out as we go. And learning yourself is important. Absolutely. Learning how you tick and your ins and outs, that's probably how I've survived so long. By learning my warning signs, learning my behaviors, learning how to try and cope. But that is no substitute for getting help. My therapist um, helped me identify my early warning signs and kind of gave me the homework of 
try this, try that, see what works for you, write it down. And that's helped me. Um, even though I'm not in therapy or counseling now, the, the tools I learned from them have helped me now. Um, and really, by going to therapy, I now know how to voice what I need from others. I'm so blessed to have a close group of friends where if we're hanging out and I literally am just not feeling it, I can bow out early if I need to. I can say, I don't want to go home, but I also don't want to do anything. Can we just hang out and just sit and not talk or just watch a movie? And they'll do that. Or I also have friends where I can text and say, I I can't get out of bed. I can't do anything. I'm so sorry. Can we just reschedule? And they will agree. They know what it feels like. They let me off with grace. I have a partner in Eric where I can say, this is what I need from you emotionally right now, or in the coming week or so, this is what I need. And he can provide it or he can just get out of my way if that's what I need. And then he's also the same partner where if a bad day or a bad couple of days sneaks up on me, I can let him know and he won't feel, he won't take it personally. He won't try and, you know, do that pseudoscience, talk me out of it. Like, oh, well, it's all in your head. Of course, my brain's in my head. That's why my mental health issues are in my head. You know, finding a good support system is important. Absolutely. But your friends can't do it alone. You have to be able to give them the tools. Unless your friends are in therapy and they know how to help, that's great. Because then that's a huge blessing for you. But if your friends are just as clueless as you are and it's the blind leading the blind, you guys could inadvertently lead each other off a cliff. And you don't want to blame your friend for that. You don't want to blame yourself for that. Everyone can benefit from therapy. Like I was saying, what is the worst that could happen? Someone makes fun of you? If they make fun of you for seeking help to better yourself, then isn't that more of a remark against them and the fact that they definitely need help than it is saying anything negative about you? As social creatures, yes, we want to do what the herd is doing. We want to be like everyone else. We want to be like our friends. But you could be the friend that starts that trend. You could be the friend that says, hey, I'm getting help. You should get help. You should see my therapist. You should see a therapist. This is what I learned in therapy this week, and it's been so empowering. This has really helped me. This was something I never even considered, but, and the little things really add up. You know, my FOMO sometimes, my fear of missing out that flares up sometimes, it does come from abandonment issues. Um, It does come from growing up unrepresented as a mixed child, and really feeling like I had no place to belong. Those things built up together to form my occasional fear of missing out. Um, My extrovert, like I don't have the energy to do this, but I'm going to throw myself into it because it's better being exhausted and wrung out is better than being left out. And that's not healthy. I know that I need so much sleep to be a functioning human being. I know that in order to get what's done, get what it's needing to be done, done, that I have to invest certain things. If I don't invest the time and energy into myself, I can't get what I need to get done. So I had to let that fear of missing out and constantly saying yes to things, even though I knew I couldn't or shouldn't, I had to let that go. I had to start saying no to more things. And that's helped me a lot because I mean, Shoot, there was at least a year or two of my life where all I did was go out with friends and hang out with friends and do stuff with friends because I didn't want to be left out, because I wanted to belong, because I wanted to fulfill that abandonment need in the back of my mind that kept saying, well, we need to do something. We need to do this. We aren't a good friend if we don't do this. We aren't a good person if we don't do that. If I had shut that up, I wouldn't have wasted a year or two of, of my college career. Because really, that's what I did. All I did was go out with friends and hang out with them and do things with them. And I was not focusing on myself or my education. And I can see that now after getting help, after, you know, hindsight is always twenty twenty. So your assignment this week, guys, is to look at yourself, look at your choices, and see what are you skipping out on in your life because you're not taking care of yourself. 
As always, we look forward to seeing you next show. Subscribe, and all of our social media will be in the show notes. Thanks so much. Have a great one, guys. And just as a disclaimer, I am not a medical professional. Nothing in this podcast is meant to diagnose or be used as treatment for someone who may or may not have mental issues, for example, depression, anxiety, or anything that may fall under those umbrellas. This is simply my viewpoint on my situation that I'm sharing with you.